Uh, I'm welcome everyone here at the uh, regular workshop that takes place uh, within the framework of the April HSC conference. Uh, we are having an exciting uh, time period, short but very intensive, ahead of us. Uh, for those of you though, who are not familiar with our laboratory, I would like to say a few words. The Laboratory for Comparative Social Research was established in 2010 when John of uh, got the, uh, a large grant from the Russian government uh, to establish this laboratory focuses mostly on uh, cross-cultural, cross-country analysis using uh, data from uh, international projects such as World Value Survey. European Value Survey and other such projects. Uh, this year is quite exciting because uh, we are going to um, launch another wave of Polish Value Survey and European Value Survey here in Russia. And the laboratory uh, it represents these two projects uh, here in Russia. Uh, the, the laboratory is producing uh, quite a lot of publications and helps uh, uh, move uh, the HSC rating in uh, public. And uh, therefore, I think we are uh, we have a bright future ahead of us. And uh, right now, we are going to have a very exciting panel with uh, Ronald Lindelhart and also uh, Christian Velsko. Uh, Again, most people know them, uh, so perhaps there's no need for an expert uh, introduction. Ronald Lindelhart is the founding president of the World Value Survey Association, uh, professor of political science at the University of Michigan and uh, high school economics. And Christian Delso, his strong uh, term co-author and vice president of the World Value Survey Association, uh, professor of political science in, uh, at the University of Leofana in Lundruk, and also at the High School of Economics. So without uh, further ado, I will yield the floor uh, to Ronald Lindelhart, who is going to present uh, on a very um, uh, topical issue, Trump and uh, the Republic Populist Party. Ron, you're going to have 30 minutes for presentation. I will remind you about time once in a while, and we'll hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Ed. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see some old friends. Over the years, uh, we, this project, the laboratory began in 2010, and now we're in our eighth year, and I have some dear old friends, glad to see you, and uh, new faces too, welcome to you, nice to see you too. And uh, I was just, I, I can't help noticing that my friend Chris has just come up with a superb new book in Russia. It is called Freedom Rising. I've read it in English. I'm sure the Russians even better. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of these projects. I, have to, I also am proud to say that my presentation today is drawing on a book I've just finished, which also will be published in Russian. And I'm sure the Russian version will be better than the English. But the English version is now under review by Cambridge University Press, and it is being published by the Higher School of Economics, and it is Mir, or something like that, the Mir Publishing Company. They yes. Tell me how greedy is that. Mir. I was perfect. <laughs> People generally mistake me for a Russian when I first encountered it. Okay, I got that one right somehow. I Okay. What I'm going to present is going to be an abbreviated version a part of the book, and this, actually I was working on it this morning, the book, though it's under review, is still being improved, and I'm hoping to make it better still, uh, as it goes on until finally it goes to press. It uh, starts out, one of the findings is, this wave of right-wing xenophobic authoritarian parties that has swept, alas, has swept Brexit, Britain leaving the European Union, 
a sort of xenophobic reaction that swept Donald Trump into power. So now I can confidently say the U.S. is better governed than Zimbabwe, probably better governed than North Korea. Beyond that, I'm a little shaky. It's, uh, it is, let's say he's an impulsive person. I won't dwell on that in any very detail, but uh, things are lively. Anyway, this is surprisingly enough, having done analyses of who votes for these parties, the literature emphasizes economic decay, which is absolutely true, the declining economic status, but it's a little more complicated than that. The immediate trigger quite clearly is not economic issues. It is cultural backlash. And this is something that Pippa Norris and I demonstrated in a paper presented last uh, September in the American Political Science Association. It is being published in June in Perspectives on Politics, a publication of the American Political Science Association. It's a bit complicated, but quite clearly, economic concerns are a secondary but important factor in the background. The immediate trigger is cultural backlash, xenophobia. Authoritarian xenophobia linked with insecurity is what's probably immediately triggering the vote. And curiously enough, it's quite clear that people who are concerned with the economy tended to vote for Hillary Clinton, who of course really won. She got 2,800,000 more votes than Donald Trump, mine among them, and uh, the American electoral comment system is a rickety leftover from the days when uh, Britain once had rotten boroughs, and uh, the US still has a rickety system where merely winning the vote doesn't get you the presidency. Even if you win by almost 3 million votes, you still don't get the presidency, the Electoral College and such. I won't go into the details, it's uh, another story. OK, having said all this, I then go on today's presentation. We'll take it for granted that you've read this superb paper. Uh, by Primanoris and me, and that you can read it in June in Perspectives on Politics, demonstrating a cultural backlash. Xenophobia is the driving force that triggers people to vote for these parties. Nevertheless, all the people who have been talking about economic factors are not stupid. This is the driving force because it's insecurity that drives xenophobia. And though we, we have a combination of cohort effects and period effects, which is a technical thing. Let me simply say that the driving force driving everyone to be more xenophobic now is economic stagnation. And that's what I'm going to mostly talk about today. Because my big claim for today's paper is that we are moving into the 21st century, a phase that goes beyond. Uh, I remember being excited about the rise of post-industrial society, reading wonderful literature on that, being excited about the sort of the wave, the cutting wave of the future. That was the cutting wave of the future. It was an interesting phase. We are now moving beyond that into what I call artificial intelligence society, which is full of wonderful things. Artificial intelligence enables me to get on my cell phone or my internet and learn anything. I am omniscient. You know, more or less. If a question comes up and I don't know the answer, or in a, in a seminar a question comes up and we don't know the answer, one of my students will zap onto the internet and within three minutes, probably, have the answer. This is one of the many wonderful things about visual intelligence society. Another wonderful thing is that it enables us to make nano robots that will go through your bloodstream, tiny, tiny robots that go through your bloodstream and zero in on cancer cells and kill the cancer cells without killing the good cells. This is, this is really good. It means people can live well and healthy. I will certainly not be a Luddite and say artificial intelligence society is bad. I think it has wonderful upside, huge, huge upside. He can be omniscient, omnipresent, uh, live forever, maybe if we believe uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, maybe live forever. I'm not totally sure of that, but a long, long time, and uh, these are the things. And today, I will dwell on the downside of artificial intelligence society. Not that I think it's hopeless, 
We can cure it, but we're going to have to work hard and we're going to have to work fast. I, because I would say that artificial intelligence society is a phase of development which is inherently conducive to inequality. Uh, I've got some lovely slides, but rather than go through them at an early point, I'd like to sort of give you the basic drive of what I have to say. There are two reasons why we are moving into a phase of society which inherently tends to bring massive and growing economic inequality. And this is very bad. It is already has resulted in Trump and Brexit and the National Front who will probably win the first round, but not the final round of the voting for the presidency of France and very alarming phenomenon, a sort of xenophobic reaction based on the reality that there is an inherent built-in tendency for the phase of society that we are moving into to be rising in equal. There are two basic reasons. One, knowledge society itself tends to produce economic inequality. So the basic reason it is, you know, I like knowledge society. I am in favor of knowledge. Uh, my job is part of the knowledge society. Again, I'm not anti-knowledge. But the knowledge society tends to be inherently unequal. The reason I'll sketch out in very concrete terms, and I think you'll agree, in industrial society, the good old days, I remember the rise of the working class, the New Deal, economic redistribution, all kinds of Marxist and non-Marxist ways that actually redistributed income. This was the glorious old days of industrial society in which, for most of the 20th century, we had rising economic equality. We had redistributed governments elected by working class based parties of the left that redistributed and brought about pensions and social security and in any civilized country but the US, universal health care. We are struggling now to unroll a feeble attempt at universal health care in the US. Again, we're better governed than Zimbabwe, I'm sure. But we're not the best governed country in the world right now. Okay. The industrial society's classic model had this struggles and tra tragedy and fights and stuff. But it resulted in rising economic equality and a working class that was doing well and was secure. And it gave rise to things that I really will applaud. My first book, The Silent Revolution, talked about the consequences of rising existential security leading to greater openness, tolerance, post materials values, emancipation of women, uh, growing acceptance of foreigners, of new ideas, of gays and lesbians. This is really a era of glorious progress, in my opinion. We are now moving in a counter era that could be described as the silent revolution in reverse. Based on the same logic, the logic is rising existential security makes people more secure, open, trusting, less xenophobic. We're now in an era in, high, in highly developed countries, not the whole world, but in highly developed, high income countries, we're in an era of rising inequality, declining existential security. Superficially, it looks like these economies are doing great. The stock market is booming in the US at an all time high. <coughs> the GNP is high, but the workforce is not. There are gains, and they're nearly all going to the top 10%, mostly the top 1%. Extreme inequality. And this is inherent in the knowledge society because in the classic industrial economy, <coughs> you produce material things. And they cost to produce. Let's say automobiles were perhaps the golden product that drove the uh, industrial society. Everyone got an automobile. This required a lot of manufacturing, a lot of jobs. And with automobiles, you can produce anything but tiny, inexpensive little car that is cheap, cheap to make, uh, cheap to buy, and then a sort of slightly bigger compact car, and then a mid-sized car, and a bigger mid-sized car, and then a giant car, and the dream of my teenage years, the Cadillac with tail fins and chrome, and those were the days. <laughs> and of course, uh, beyond my dreams was the uh, 
the Rolls Royce is extremely expensive. There's a range, and they competed on price. A whole range of products. In the knowledge society, it may cost a lot to produce Microsoft or Facebook or any of the number of things, but once you produce Microsoft, the cost of reproducing additional copies and distributing them is almost nothing. You or I, with uh, a little instruction, could make duplicate copies of Microsoft and zap it around the world with the internet almost for nothing. Let's say 10 cents and you get Microsoft. This means that once you produce the Rolls Royce, there's no need the, there's no need to produce anything but the top product dominates the market. Bill Gates becomes a billionaire before he's 40. I admire and like Bill Gates. However, through no fault of his own, his product is on my computer here when I go to China or Nigeria or Brazil. It's probably Microsoft sitting there on the, uh, on the machine because it's a good product and the top product dominates the market. It rules the universe. Huge profits going to the top. But is there a Chevrolet version of Microsoft? You'd be an idiot. Why do a second-rate, cheaper version of Microsoft when you can get the top version for basically no more? It's the cost of reproducing in the knowledge society. Knowledge can be reproduced endlessly. I could produce a billion copies of Microsoft, and it would not cost a lot to do it once you have the version. So inherently, this is not because Bill Gates is a criminal at all. No, this is, Bill Gates is actually a good guy in my perspective. But in the knowledge society, it's different from an industrial society. There's not a room for a, a hundred niches from the little bitty uh, sort of almost bicycle cab that they produced in India to the giant uh, I suppose I would prefer BMW or Rolls Royce, but anyway, they're, they're very expensive cars. They compete, uh, the Jaguar is a lovely car. Um, they compete on price with Microsoft and the Knowledge Society. But I'm only beginning. Okay. Uh, uh, this, is, this is much too exciting to go, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll respect the uh, laws. Reason number one why there's rising inequality. In the knowledge society, the cost of producing and distributing copies of the top product is zero. And the top product rules the universe. Bill Gates has profited enormously by this. And uh, rather a tribute to the fact that he's not only clever, he's also, I think, wise. Having made billions and billions become, he sort of uh, rotates with uh, Warren Buffett and Carlos Slim for richest man on earth. Although there are one or two people I could name in Russia who compete too, but this I will not, I will pass over quietly. Uh, let's say the top product rules the universe, and uh, this is true. That's only half of the story. Already this leads toward rising inequality inherently, without any evil intent on the part of the top dog. Uh, Bill Gates actually is divided into the audience second half of his life to philanthropy, signaling that he's not merely good at capturing fortunes, but he has a sense of more and more and more and more of the same. It doesn't really pay off, and, I, and I've done research indicating that happiness is linked with economic prosperity at the lower end of the spectrum. spectrum. A little economic gain brings lots of increase in subjective well-being, but above a certain level, there's almost no further gain. And I think Bill Gates has either read one of my papers or intuitively grasped this, much, much more likely the latter, uh, and uh, is not devoting his whole life to more and more billions. He's got 50 billion, and he probably senses that an additional 50 billion will not make him twice as happy, which is absolutely true. Okay, reason number one, the top product rules the universe. Reason number two, and this is newer, and this is something I've only been discovering with the aid of brilliant research assistants, uh, but it is, I'm convinced, absolutely true. 
We are moving into an advanced phase of the modern society called artificial intelligence society, in which everyone is vulnerable to replacement. We can, you and I, it's hard to believe that a brilliant social scientist could be produced by a artificial intelligence, but the evidence is dismayingly strong. Already we have artificial intelligence that can do diagnoses of medical conditions more accurately and much, much, much faster, using a database of billions of cases, better than a physician. Already we have computer programs that can read x-rays and do diagnoses, and they've done impressive tests of this, comparing one physician with one other physician, their rate of agreement, instead of as a test of reliability, and then computer and physician, the computer comes out with a better reliability score than the doctors. Already we've got, and this is, you know, next year they'll be better still. Already we have computer programs that can, that can diagnose x-rays more accurately and way faster and way cheaper. The sort of the interim trick is, if I get an x-ray at the University of Michigan, it is zapped by the internet to India, and a skilled Indian uh, physician reads and interprets it, and he zaps back to the diagnosis, because you can pay Indian physicians a fraction of what you pay American physicians, but this is a thing in the past. The Indian physician cannot compete with the computer program. They don't, you know, the, 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 an Indian physician is grotesquely expensive compared to artificial intelligence. Once you get the program, electricity is not that expensive. And you plug it in and uh, 24 hours a day, very quickly, you get better diagnoses than the Indian physician. Who, of course, I have great respect for. I'm sure they're doing a good job. But not as good as artificial intelligence. This is true of law. In the law profession, there is no unemployment. It used to be that if you got a law degree, you were secure and well paid, or part of the upper middle class. Today, 40% of the people who graduate from law school wind up taking jobs that don't require a law degree. One reason is because we now have computer programs that can do the process of discovery which is reading millions of pages of documents and sort of establishing basic facts and organizing them and the, the conclusions are the consensus is that. And artificial intelligence now can and is doing this to the point where big law firms used to hire brand new lawyers fresh from Yale or Harvard or inner city Illinois with a law degree. And they would do the process of discovery. Don't need them anymore. We have artificial intelligence doing it. It is, of course, almost too horrible to believe, but not only do we have computer programs that can play Go, uh, the, the world champion chess player was beaten long ago. Go is a much more complex game. And now we have computer artificial intelligence that can beat the best Go players in a recent tournament. 60 out of 60 matches against the best goal players in China, Korea, Japan were defeated by an artificial intelligence system. This leads me to believe, tragic though it may be, that somewhere down the road, probably is it 10 years, 5 years, 6 months, I'm not sure, there's going to be artificial intelligence that does my job better than me. This is really, this is really going to fun. And uh, nevertheless, if I yield to my cognitive processing, I'm afraid this is it. Uh, so, basically, part two of the phase of society we're moving into is anyone's job can be replaced. We are all vulnerable, and the gains, the economic gains of the past 30 years have gone overwhelmingly to the top, and this is going to go more and more to the top. It's as Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, has pointed out, the economic gains are going to the 1%. The big political conflict of the future is no longer between <coughs> working class and middle class, no longer between American workers and Mexican workers. This is sort of an interim thing, and building this wall to keep out the hordes of Mexican rapists and criminals 
and perhaps a few good people too, as Donald Trump acknowledges an afterthought. They're mostly criminals in this, in this view. Uh, this is, you know, I do not admire this man highly. Uh, this, five minutes, okay. I have 42 slides to show you. <laughs> I'm not going to get through them because this is a complicated subject and I've given you the highlights, basically. We are moving into a world in which, inherently, <coughs> not just because the capitalists are greedy and tricky and have got the Congress in their pocket, which they have, but uh, because big, does money control Congress? Yeah. I voted for Hillary Clinton knowing that though Donald Trump was totally in the pocket of the 1%, Hillary was sort of in the pocket of the 1% too, but I, you, you make your choice between what's available. The reality is not just that the 1% are clever and greedy. It's that structural factors enable them to be clever and greedy much better than used to be the case. I think the capitalists were always clever, some were always clever and greedy, but there used to be powerful labor-based political parties that limited their ability to do this. We do not yet have recognition of what the conflict is today. It's no longer labor versus management, or Americans versus foreigners. It's between humans and artificial intelligence. This is really the big thing. And blaming it on the Mexicans or the Chinese is, okay, psychologically understandable because you can see them and we have built up uh, sort of deep-rooted instincts to be scared of foreigners if you trigger insecurity. But this is not the real conflict. The real conflict for politics in the 21st century is humans mastering artificial intelligence. I've talked about the downside, and I hope I've scared you, but of course it's not too late. Humans have got to organize in ways that first of all reallocate resources from the 1% to society as a whole. It is not that Donald Trump and the other billionaires are inherently gifted. It is built in advantages. You start out with $30 million from daddy, and if he, would, if he had blindly invested it in the stock market, he'd actually be richer than he is. He is not a brilliant businessman, but if you start with $30 billion, uh, it's $30 million, it is, in a rising economy, not difficult to get richer still. So if you blindly put it into an index fund, and you get very, very rich. I think though the, the 1%, the basic inherent conflict is between the 1% and the 30%, I mean 99%, as Stiglitz puts it, this is a not a hopeless fight. In democracies, the 99%, if a large share of them, develop a sense of class consciousness and recognize what the real conflict is, they're a winning combination and can elect governments that we allocate resources for the benefit of everyone. We can install governments that create jobs that need humans. This collection of very bright people, if we got together this kind of weekend, could come up with 30 programs that would put people to work doing useful, valuable things that require a human touch, and uh, that require, and that would give meaningful jobs to human beings. This is something that is going to require creativity and imagination and work. And this is the agenda for social scientists for the coming decades. But is it always? No, of course not. The good news is we have rising economic insecurity and a phenomenon that is frighteningly similar to the 1930s when we saw the rise of Adolf Hitler and fascist movements throughout many countries in the face of economic insecurity resulting from poverty, from the Great Depression when we had too few resources. Actually, this time around we've got lots of resources and artificial intelligence has growing resources. We could design societies that would be really good where we would have a flourishing of research and development in social science. I think that's really quite honestly I think social scientists have a crucial role to play in designing what will be a fundamentally different society from what we have had up to now. Because 
the economics base of it is fundamentally different. Social science will play a role, but I would say roles for arts and humanities too, which are kind of starving now, I would say these are human beings could be usefully employed in doing this. And this is not a wild stretch of the imagination. I remember the programs of the New Deal in the U.S. when I was a little boy. When they had people painting murals and building uh, things and even putting on plays and writing books sponsored by the government. And uh, this is, if we were smart enough to do this in the 30s, I think we're probably smart enough to do it in the 21st century. So it's not hopeless. But we need this new coalition. I see zero minutes on the... Uh, that's about right. Well, wait a minute. I, I have 42 slides. <laughs> How about I show you just one or two of these slides because I'm going to have to zip through. Okay, let's go. Here is rising inequality. Uh, this is one of the... One of the facts is economic inequality has risen tremendously. Most of the 20th century was rising redistribution of inequality. This is the Piketty story, but it is rather different from Piketty because it shows in detail, which he doesn't bother with. Some societies have handled this much better than others. Sweden used to have much higher inequality than the US, and now it has much less inequality than the US. The US has gone from being more equal, uh, the dotted line at about 40% level at the start, to being more unequal than the European countries. This golden land of opportunity that I knew about in grade school is not the reality anymore. It depends on the political system. Sweden is doing a better job than the US. Then let me skip rapidly down to, okay, another thing, this is the uh, elephant curve that Milanovic has come up with, and it shows Piketty is wrong. Capitalism is not inherently one of rising inequality. This is real gains in the world as a whole. And at point A, this is sort of the elephant curve where you get the Trump modest gains, but most of the world in the last 20 years has made quite substantial gains in real per capita income. China, India, Indonesia, Thailand, etc., are around point A. The US, Britain, Sweden, Germany, Australia, etc., are around point B, with Essentially, no gains in real capita in the last 20 years. There have been real gains, but point C is the top one percent, mostly in the high end of country. They started with big fortunes, and they've gotten much richer. And this inequality has risen to the point where we've gone from the ratio of income to the chief executive of a corporation from being in the 1970s about 20 to one. Lousy. They were getting richly. The average worker was getting 5% as much as a chief executive officer. Scandalous. Today it's 340 times. The ratio has gone from appreciable to incredible. Is it because the chief executive officers are 17 times as clever as they used to be? Well, Donald Trump would say yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I agree. In fact, we had higher growth rates in the 70s than we have today. It is, I think, a feature of structural factors in the economy which we need to recognize and act to correct. Sorry, I, you, you missed 39 really good slides. <laughs> Sorry about this. Okay? Now we have some time for questions and answers. Uh, I just, uh, you identify yourself, please? Um, Dr. Tarun I'm from England. I just finished my PhD from the University of Bath. So I have a good number of questions. I liked it very much. It's very interesting. Uh, my one question is that actually, um, I think I'm okay with my um, <coughs> Because I think that inequality, is the inevitable outcome of capitalistic society. So do you have any solution keeping capitalistic mode of production in place to reduce inequality? 
Okay, let me deal with that question. It's a pretty big question. Can I finish all my questions together? <laughs> because I, I have lots of questions. I get lost, but go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, because I have some more questions. Uh, would you allow me to ask more uh, questions? Well, let's do it one at a time, please. Okay, that's fine. Otherwise, the speaker may forget. That's fine. Your, okay. your other that's questions. Please. Having done this, hmm. by the time I'm in the seventh question, I forget which the first one was. But in answer to this question, which I think is, is a very serious question, I think yes. This display showing the difference between Sweden and the US is an example. It depends on the government. It is not that we are hopeless, helpless pawns in the group of capitalism. Capitalism is inherently unequal. I agree. Advantages tend to be cumulative because if you're born into a prosperous, well educated family, you're going to start getting pre better prenatal care. You can get better nutrition and health care as a child, better education better social contacts, all these things, they snowball. Uh, it's inherently it tends to be unequal. This is true of capitalism and more or less any system, pre-feudal uh, pre pre feudal societies where there was very little property rather than egalitarian. But once you get private property ownership, it tends to snowball. So yes, but this is not something we're unable to do anything about. Throughout most of the 20th century, capitalist societies have rising equality rising standard of living, rising real income, because governments can do something about it. Governments were elected by working class based parties on the left that redistributed income and had social security and public health and public education and infrastructure, all kinds of stuff that benefited society as a whole. It is not that we are stupid pawns. We are capable of organizing and putting in place governments that redistribute resources for the benefit of all. And different government, no, no government will do it perfectly, but let's say Sweden did a pretty good job. The US for a while did a pretty good job, and lately has not been a good job. That's just my answer. Mm -hmm. Another thing is actually um, with the rising capitalist, capitalistic nature of the state. You know, artificial intelligence will keep increasing because, as you said, artificial intelligence is uh, more efficient. It can do things in a cheaper rate, in less time. <coughs> so, I mean, uh, do you think this rise of artificial intelligence is in contradiction with the knowledge society? <coughs> no. I think they support each other. The knowledge society Actually, artificial intelligence is society is a advanced phase of the knowledge society in which <coughs> what's distinctive is it is no longer just the unskilled laborer who's being automated and left hopeless. Today, in the future, it's going to be PhDs, people like us mm -hmm. who can be replaced, and we have to do something about it. I think it was. We needed to do something about it already when uneducated workers were being left superfluous. When we're all superfluous, I think we all need to act. We have a big incentive. I would not underestimate, I would say by far the biggest challenge for the 21st century is not going to be communism, capitalism, or uh, Donald Trump, or the Mexicans, or the Chinese versus the Americans. It's going to be humans versus artificial intelligence. Can we stay in the driver's seat? If we control it, we can have very, very interesting lives. I'm not sure we'll stay in the driver's seat. We may no longer be at the top of the food chain. We may be, if we're lucky, treated as well as we treat the little dogs and cats. And if we're not lucky, we may be treated like the hogs and calves that are raised for food, and I won't go into the details, but if you read about it, it's not a happy fate. I don't turn any questions to the economics. I got a short question. How do you define artificial intelligence? So, uh, when do you mean those <coughs> For computational power of the computers right now, nanotechnology you were mentioning, uh, or you think about artificial intelligence about computers asking to write questions? Because until now, humans are asking the questions and the computers are answering them much better mm -hmm. than humans. 
So what do you understand under artificial intelligence? In yeah, sense? The crucial thing is we go beyond computer programs that only do what they're programmed to do to computer programs that learn on their own. And they can learn very fast. They can learn much faster than humans learn. And they can learn from huge databases. We already have these. We have <coughs> computer programs that learn new things. We have computer programs that write computer programs. And the, the progress in this area is scary. Because once you get them going, they're working 24 hours a day at a speed of 100 times, a 1,000 times as fast as a human. They all race us. So it's not just that the computer programs do what they're programmed to do. They learn independently. They analyze situations. They can analyze and recognize faces. They can analyze x-rays or diagnosis statistics and come up with better, quicker conclusions than humans can. This is a real challenge. So I would say artificial intelligence is not just the, the, the reassuring story was computers can only do what they're programmed to do. This is no longer true. They can learn on their own now. Yes. Munich, thank you very much for your talk. I have uh, a question, or should I rather say doubt? about the relationship between economic hardship and inequality on the one hand and uh, cultural backlash <coughs> and uh, popular parties on the other hand. Because the, the graph you showed um, with the different countries and different degrees of, uh, of inequality um, actually poses a question because in each of those countries you have populist parties and mm -hmm. xenophobic uh, um, attitudes in, 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 in the population. To, I would say more or less uh, with the same degree. And even under the Obama years, I think um, inequality actually declined, yet Trump <coughs> back. So uh, in my view, I would think it's rather a, a, an issue of salience of the matter, and xenophobic issues can become salient precisely if economic issues are not on the agenda. So I would think it's actually rather the, the, the reverse would, would be actually the case. Okay, the, the initial three or four minutes of my talk was pointing out, as the, uh, the paper that I mentioned does, it's more complicated. It is not a one-to-one -one relationship between inequality and economic difficulty. And this is surprising and complicating, and there's a large, very interesting literature on rising inequality and so on, which simply assumes that people are voting for Donald Trump or Le Pen because of inequality, and that's not the case. It is, as you suggest, xenophobia, triggered by insecurity. But there are two different questions. One is, why do people vote for Le Pen or for the uh, alternative for Germany or for Donald Trump or for Brexit? And the answer is mostly xenophobia. That is the driving thing, and this is the psychological reality is humans are vulnerable to xenophobic reactions, but it is much more likely under conditions of insecurity than under conditions of security. In the boom years of the 50s, there were loads of immigrants coming into Germany for, in a booming economy, and they didn't they produce any big backlash. Now they're producing a very big backlash to the point where right-wing parties that once were beyond the pale are becoming big. The second, first question is why do people vote for xenophobic parties? And that is xenophobia cultural backlash. But there's a second question, why is the vote for xenophobic parties much higher now than it was 30 years ago? The answer to that is because of rising inequality. And this is sort of invisible because superficially the economy is doing well. GNP per capita is rising only for at least half of the population. There has been declining real income, declining job security, a sense of hopelessness to the point where drug abuse is common among the white working class to the point where life expectancy is falling. 
one of the sort of the obvious parts of my decision is life expectancy rises, just like water flows downhill. As you get richer and more prosperous and better public health and better nutrition, all these things, you have rising life expectancy. In the last year, life expectancy in the US fell. It fell not uniformly. It fell because <clears throat> among the white working class, particularly those out of the job market, drug abuse is so widespread, the sense of hopelessness, going nowhere, they're not starving. But drug abuse and alcoholism and things like this are so widespread that they're pulling down life expectancy of this segment quite a lot. And this is so important that it's pulling down life expectancy for the USA slightly. Okay, and the last chance to uh, <coughs> uh, ask a question goes to Francesco Saracino of Stockholm Luxembourg. Thanks, Do you need a mic? No, I don't think I need a mic. Uh, by the way, uh, my opinion doesn't in involve the opinion of my institute. Because, <laughs> okay, I love your talk and uh, um, I look forward to the book. I am about to claim that capitalism is dead or is in very bad shape. And this is not because of the working class or because of state intervention. This is because of capitalism itself. Uh, partly because of the dynamics we spoke about, automatization or artificial intelligence. The point is that the big difference that I see between nowadays and the 30s is that uh, uh, the marginal cost of production is going to zero. Mm -hmm. There is a constant downward pressure in salaries and uh, the cost of production, capi capital, once established, goes to zero. So this means that uh, we are moving towards a situation where we can basically produce indefinitely at very low cost, which in other words means having solved the problem of economic scarcity. In this situation, we can do two things. Either we sell products and services at zero cost, then the top 1% has no interest, or we have to redistribute. And this is interesting to read nowadays, and to, 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 sorry, to read today, that Madame Lagarde announces that the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and World Trade Organization are studies the minimum income option. So I think that uh, if we don't go into war with North Korea first, mm -hmm. we might see some uh, interesting uh, changes in the way we have organized our uh, economies and societies so far. Okay. As always, your comments are insightful, and actually, I don't disagree. It's kind of a matter of label. I would say, is capitalism, does capitalism need to have massive revision? That's the whole thrust. I think we need redistribution, for sure. The gains are going to the 1% or whoever controls the artificial intelligence, which may not be as long as they think they can stay in control. However, I think we clearly need, we have growing resources, which could make a very good life for everyone. I would say that probably would keep a market economy. I would not move to a state-run economy. I would move clearly toward redistributing the goods for the benefit of society. So uh, this is, if you want to label it post beyond capitalism, okay. Uh, this is uh, something in the American context we don't like to do, but Let's say massive redistribution, I think, is in the cards, necessarily. And I think the need to control artificial intelligence is an enormous challenge. Can it be done? I have not lost hope, but I think this is a much bigger challenge. Uh, it's sort of not capitalism versus communism any longer. I would say it's humans and artificial intelligence. Who's going to make be at the top of the command? Uh, it is by no means, though there have been some wonderful scary science fiction movies made about uh, the artificial intelligence takes over, these are not necessarily, I would say that the idea is not ludicrous. I would say it is bright people, very bright people, see this in varying ways. Elon Musk thinks it's a very bad thing. Whereas Ray Kurzweil thinks, oh yes, we will be replaced by uh, silicon-based life forms, but they'll be much better. So it's okay. Uh, I tend to, I am one of these traditionalists who likes carbon-based life 
folks. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you, Ron.